Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, so, really happy to introduce our next speaker for the festival, first speaker for um, today, our second and final day, uh, who is Zoe Waters. Zoe is a scholar of feminism, phenomenology and continental thought, working out of Newcastle University. She has also published on the history of Italian thought. The title of Zoe's presentation today is Merleau-Ponty's Account of Painting. We're re really looking forward to that, Zoe. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, um, so I'm a little bit nervous. I haven't really done much public speaking before apart from seminars, so I'm just going to throw that out there. So please forgive me if I'm a little bit stuttery. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to focus on Merleau-Ponty today, who's a French phenomenologist. Um, so I'm going to start my paper by discussing um, what phenomenology is, go on to discuss what's specific to Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology, um, before I move on to relate this to painting. Um, so when I'm talking about painting, I'm firstly going to talk about the painter's perspective and then what occurs um, when a painting is perceived by a viewer. Um, so I hope to discuss the phenomenological significance of painting throughout and argue um, by the end that painting is a way of thinking or a way of perceiving like phenomenology. Um, <clears throat> so phenomenology is obviously the school of thought that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, so first I'll answer what is phenomenology. So phenomenology can be considered as a movement in the history of philosophy um, that was started with um, Edmund Hurl and Martin Heidegger as the key figureheads. Um, it can also be considered a method or a way of doing philosophy that involves examining how phenomena appears to us. So phenomenology in short is the study of that which appears. Um, it's about appearance in terms of how things immediately appear to us. Um, it's about providing a description about how we experience phenomena as it comes into our consciousness. Um, so more simply, how we are conscious of phenomena. So phenomenology aims to reveal these universal aspects or truths about the structures of our consciousness, but it's a process um, that starts with the first person perspective first. Um, so this is essentially what the phenomenological method is. Um, so I'm going to move on to discuss Heidegger briefly um, to unpack his concept of world as meaning, which is a concept that becomes central to Merleau-Ponty's thought. Um, so I think to understand this, at first we need to um, understand Heidegger's conception of the human as um, being in the world. Um, so what this means in short is that humans are always entangled with the world. Um, we're always thinking about something, eating something, planning something, um, doing something, remembering something and so on. Um, so we experience the world as a horizon of possibilities for us. Um, this means for Heidegger and as we'll see later with Merleau-Ponty that we are always caught up in a meaningful relationship with the, to the world or caught up in a meaningful relation to the world. Um, so I want to unpack what is meant by meaning or meaningful here. Um, since we don't mean meaningful um, as something particularly profound or significant to us, um, it's more to do with Heidegger's notion of truth, as I understand, um, which aligns more closely to an idea somewhat like um, immediate understanding or instinctive comprehension. Um, so before I go on to this, I'm, I'm just going to take a quick step back and think about how we usually think about truth. Um, so we usually think about truth as a kind of correspondence theory where we say the rug is square and then we check the shape of the rug um, to assess the truth value of that statement given that the rug is square. Um, so we check if the reality corresponds with the statement, hence it being um, correspondence theory. But truth for Heidegger is different. So it's more like a way of existence that features an immediate understanding of that which has been experienced. So truth is this grip and understanding that we have on the world. So when I see a mug, um, I see a possibility in relation to me. I can understand that I can move it or I can take a drink out of it. Um, and this is what it means to say that the world is disclosed to us as a horizon of meaningful possibilities. Uh, we see the world as meaning. Um, and it's important to note that this understanding, um, this meaningful relation or truth um, takes place prior to or without any philosophical understanding or abstraction. 
So we have this immediate understanding um, that we have of the world and the objects in it and the others in it. So for Heidegger, the basic relation that we have with the world is practical rather than theoretical. So the things and tools that we deploy are not understood theoretically. Um, when we handle or use tools, um, this understanding of them that we've got is practical. Um, so it's not a theoretical relation of knowledge, but a knowledge of using. So this relation to objects in the world, Heidegger refers to as ready to hand. Um, we come to know tools through the process of using them. We come to know them through what Merleau Ponty terms habit. Um, so let's imagine we're using a hammer to hang up a photograph on a wall. Um, so we come and know the action, the, we come and know the hammer through the action of hammering. So the truth of the hammer is known through this process of its use for Heidegger. And more than this, the hammer's meaning is gained through this contextual relation that it has to the wall and the names and the, the photo frame. Um, so we, we understand these tools only in context with each other. And um, so like a, a nail would make sense out of context without a hammer. Um, so these relations of reference bind together to make one kind of equipmental context. Um, and all of these tools have to refer to each other for one thing to make sense. Um, and for, for the hammering to make sense, it has to refer to some end goal of hanging up a photo on a wall. So he describes this relation um, as a relation of significance or of signification. Um, it makes a totality a whole equipment. Um, so this is what comprises for, this is what Heidegger thinks of is the world. And so um, this totality of relations is what is the world. It's the, con it, what binds the context of everything together is this world. Um, the world made up of relations between these objects. It's the references between things. Uh, it's the same as saying that the world is made up of these signifying relations. Um, the world is ready at hand. It's um, a network of tools and materials that we use in every day. It is through, it is through this world, this network of relations that meaning arises or that truth is disclosed. So this is what we mean when we say the world as meaning. The world is made up of these silent and implicit relations that run between entities rather than being an entity itself. So Heidegger wants to bring uh, this world to the foreground. Um, we usually just experience the entities, we usually just perceive as meaning. Um, so we don't actually experience the kind of relations of signification. Um, and phenomenology is concerned with revealing this. Um, it's concerned with revealing this pre-verbal, pre-conceptualized, immediate understanding that we have of the world. Um, so now I'm going to move on to start talking about what merleau E's phenomenology is like and what is specific about his phenomenology. Um, so merleau fundamentally accepts this Heideggerian concept of world as meaning. Uh, so to quote Merleau-Ponty from the text Phenomenology of Perception, he says, the world is nothing but world as meaning. Merleau-Ponty accepts that in the environment presents itself as a meaningful horizon of action, of possibilities that we might respond to. However, what is distinct from Heidegger is the focus on the body. Um, so meaning for Merleau-Ponty is opened up through the body. The, the world, the network of possibilities of relations that we have is established not through a transcendental mind, but through the body. So this means that we experience the world with relative meaning according to um, the physical body. So um, I see chocolate as something that's edible. I see, some, I see chocolate as something that I want to eat rather than as an object separate from me. Um, and dependent on my bodily state, the meaning that I have um, changes. So if I've not ate and I'm hungry, um, I might see the chocolate as like delicious or mouthwatering. But if I've just eaten loads and loads and loads of chocolate, um, I might see the chocolate as sickly or nauseating. So our perceptions of the object of, of objects in the world um, are anticipated by the body in this way. Um, Merleau-Ponty says that we perceive the world through this map of the I can. So I can eat the chocolate. 
Um, so when I see a chair, I see it as something I can sit on. Uh, when I walk into a room and see a chair, I don't conceptualise the chair theoretically first, but I immediately perceive a possibility of movement. Millipontney says that there's an intertwine and a vision in movement in this regard. When we perceive there's always the ability to move, and this is due to the fact that we are a physical body and not just a transcendental mind. So we have this dynamic interaction with the world through our body. Um, our body fundamentally affects the meaning that we see in the world. This means that when our bodies are at a disposition, the world, the meaning in the world changes. So if we lose a leg, suddenly some things that were no obstacle before, like climbing a ladder, become a huge challenge. And this is what we mean, what it, what it means to say that we perceive the world through this map of I can. We view objects within the world in relation to our bodily possibilities. Meaning is gained um, in relation via a relationship between the world um, and my purposes, my needs and my activities. This is why, as Heidegger outlined, we see the world as a horizon of possibilities, of meaningful possibilities. So for Merleau-Ponty, the world invites us to engage in a meaningful physical way. Um, as we inhabit the world through our bodies and experience through them. Um, so for Merleau-Ponty, perceptual activity is characterised in terms of the body. Perception is not about sense organs, it's more about um, a broad intuitive and bodily engagement with the world. Um, habit is important here. Uh, habit is Merleau-Ponty's reformulation of Heidegger's ready at hand or ready to hand. Um, so let's think about this, this idea of hammering again. We come to know hammering and we come to know it through the process of its use. Um, so this shows um, that certain skills just become habitual to us. Things like walking and riding a bike and opening a door. You know, I can estimate the strength I need to pick up my mug um, without calculation. Um, I just come to know this through habit. Um, so going back to this example of hammering um, a nail in the wall to hang up a photograph. Um, so um, imagine I'm um, coming around your house to look at this photograph as if it was like 2019 or something and we were allowed to do that. Um, so if I want to look and focus on this um, photograph that you have in your living room and I want to focus on the details, um, what I'll do is I'll automatically squint my eyes and move myself forward to it um, so I can see it in detail. And um, I do this, I automatically move with sight. This is intertwining of vision and movement here. And I move my body without conceptualizing these movements that I ought to undertake. And this is what it means that we come to know and we experience the world through the habitual body. So we have this kind of knowledge that is caught up within our bodies rather than a theoretical understanding. Um, it's why we have this grip on the world um, the body is our means to communicate and access the world that we are situated in. So I'm going to return to this idea of the loss of leg a little bit, because uh, this is quite a significant example for Merleau-Ponty. Um, so he talks about the phenomena of phantom limb syndrome. Um, so this is the medical condition um, where people who have lost their limbs still feel sensations in them. Um, and it happens to um, over 80% of amputees. So, um, so um, we come to gather some kind of knowledge in our bodies through habit, so much so that our body is still able to experience sensation in limbs that are absent from the body. Um, we come to know the world through the, the whole body, the unified body, which will be a concept I'll return to, um, as, as one embodied consciousness. Um, so the sudden loss of one part of the body can basically throw us off as we're so used to living through the body. Um, so I want to go back to this phrase of embodied consciousness. Um, this is basically central to Merleau-Ponty's philosophy, this notion of embodiment. So for Merleau-Ponty, the body is not considered a lump of matter that consciousness, our, our mind simply animates. The body is fundamentally a form of consciousness. Consciousness is experienced through the body rather than as isolated in what might have formerly conceived of as the mind. Merleau-Ponty wanted to reconcile the mind and the body 
and basically doing away with this mind-body distinction in favour of this notion of embodiment. So consciousness actually flows through the body, it seeps out into the limbs. Um, consciousness is, itself is something that's embodied. Um, so this is what it means to say that humans are embodied consciousnesses. For Merleau-Ponty, the body is a body subject, it's a mixture of both the material and the transcendental. Miller is also interested in the material conditions of the world. Um, so the way that the world is a mass that is perceived as already full with meaning. This mixture of the material and the transcendental again, which brings me to Miller concept of flesh. Um, so flesh captures this idea of a uh, being or beings always entangled in the world. Um, we're always interwoven with it or in relation to it. Um, it's Flesh is basically Miller-Ponty's reworking of Heidegger's phenomenological manifestation of being in the world. So meaning is to be found within this network of relations caught up between being and world. However, with flesh, Miller-Ponty emphasises the material materiality of it. Um, this web of relations is more like a fabric. Um, he describes it as the fabric of being um, of which both subject and object um, are woven from. So he develops this in his later work um, around his, his text, The Visible and the Invisible. Um, so this is um, a concept that he develops at the end of his career. Um, so um, flesh is basically the element of being that enables experience for merleau upon e. It's a level, it's a primal level of bonding between the human subject and the world that permits, um, that is the reason why we have such an immediate understanding of it. There is no subject, subject or object distinction with the notion of flesh. We're made up of the same flesh of the world. We are part of the world and meaning is created through this reciprocal relation to it. It captures this idea of meaning as something caught up between being and world, emphasising the reversible nature um, of this reciprocal relationship that we have. We are open to the world, but more than that, in communication with it as it calls on us and invites us to respond to it. Meaning is something to be found and created through activity and um, through possibilities and actions. So it's this almost paradoxical idea that the world is an, um, an already meaningful place, but it needs a subject to elicit that meaning through physical activities. So this is a, mat um, a material world that we're directed towards in a physical bodily way. Um, and it's the idea that meaning is elicited from this action it's from this relationship of being and world it's it's in between them um this is what the notion of flesh is trying to capture here um so before moving on to discuss painting um i want to dwell on this um idea that the world is lived physically rather than conceptualized um so conceptual organisation of experience, language, scientific understanding is something that is secondary to experience for Merleau-Ponty. There was already a meaningful interaction with the world first. So our body senses things before we verbalise it, um, which for Merleau-Ponty means that we have this pre-theoretical bodily engagement with the world. Rather, um, Merleau-Ponty, rather than focusing on deliberate actions, is more interested in the kind of simple, intuitive way that we engage with the world. So more like that example where I gave, of, like looking at the photograph, this like immediate way that we would just move towards the world, world when we want to see it, um, rather than kind of really thought out actions. He's just talking about the really minor um, aspects of everyday perceptive experience. Um, so he's interested in the way that the things that you just do, uh, the way that we automatically lean into something to gain better sight, this relationship that we have with the world common to both children and animals. Um, you know, he's concerned with the immediate understanding that we have prior to or without being theorised into language. Um, so this conceptual the conceptualization part is part of experience and it adds to it, it enhances it and enriches our understanding. But um, there is something that is always already meaningful first. Um, and phenomenology is about unveiling this um, initial experience. Um, uh, in my paper today, I want to argue that painting is like phenomenology in this way. 
Um, so before I go on to painting, I'm going to just give a little quick summary of um, Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology before I move on. So the kind of key points here are we're embedded in a world physically as a body. Um, we're open to the world because we're embodied. And this means that things in the world have an immediate meaning for us. OK, so I'm going to talk about painting from now on. Um, so let's think about where painting comes into it. So when I say painting, um, for the ease of understanding, um, I'm going to largely talk about the kind of act of painting. Um, and what I'm imagining is a painter kind of sat in the world, looking out and painting their experience. So kind of still lives of flowers, um, portraits, landscapes. This is what I'm um, going to be talking about mainly. So <clears throat> I'm going to try to give an account of how painters see or perceive the world differently whilst they're in the act of painting. So I'm going to read out um, a quote from Merleau-Ponty in Eye and Mind, which is his kind of main, uh, main essay on painting, although that he works across aesthetics across his work. Um, so I'll, I'll spend some time unpacking this quote. So um, Merleau-Ponty says that only the painter is entitled to look at everything without being obliged to appraise what he sees. For the painter, we might say, the watchwords of knowledge and action lose their meaning and force. So let's think about what this means. <clears throat> so what Merleau-Ponty is getting at here is the peculiar way that the painter must look at the world to see it without meaning to then be able to paint it. So in order to paint, the normal way that we perceive the world must be suspended. The painter looks at the world without being obliged to appraise what he sees. So the world as meaning is somewhat paused. The painter's perception is peculiar. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so the painter's perception is peculiar because it meaning loses its force. The usual way of experience uh, experiencing as being in the world is paused. So how is this? Um, so I'm gonna read out another quote from Miller Ponty here. The painter's gaze asks them what they do to suddenly cause something to be, and to be this thing, what they do to compose this. It's a little bit wordy. Um, but what he's getting at here is that the, paint, the painter needs to perceive the parts of the world that cause something to be. To be able to paint something, we need to be able to understand the elements that make this thing visible to us. So painters need to see the play of light, shadows, reflection, shape, depth, all these elements that um, uh, to be able to paint this perception. So painters need to see these qualities that we usually don't see, um, but are always there in some invisible sense. So painters for Merleau-Ponty are, are able to see the unnoticed or invisible scaffolding of vision. So painters are able to see the play of light, colour and depth um, that have this um, in, invisible quality. He describes them as like ghosts. So it, these are these invisible parts of our ex experience that are always present. They only have a visual existence, but that which is not visible in an ordinary perception. So to see an object, usually it is necessary not to see the play of shadows and light around it. These parts must be hidden to make the object visible itself. So if all we saw was kind of lights and, and um, colour and shapes, but without actually recognising the objects, um, this is what we're talking about here. Um, to be able to actually see them as objects with meaning to us, we're not allowed, we can't just see them as um, a, an arrangement of colour. Um, so to um, so the parts must be hidden to make the object visible to us. Um, so to create the vision of said object, the painter while painting must practice this th magical theory of vision, he says. So it's this magical performance of making the invisible infrastructures visible. So Merleau-Ponty appreciated that everyone with sight has at some point witnessed this play of shadows, um, colour, 
um, or something like it. But painters have this attuned understanding of this invisible scaffolding of vision, um, such as depth, which is something he finds particularly significant because it's not visible in the same way that colour or shape is. It's not a property of objective space. But that is not to say that colour and shape are. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, but I'm not allowed to. No, this is no good. Maybe I should have checked this before we started. You um, can now. Oh, yes. Thank you, Hannes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, do I want to put this? I just won't put the slideshow on. Um, let me figure out what I'm doing here. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> OK, let's just go back there. So um, this is a, um, an image I wanted to show you of a kind of optical illusion. I'll explain it and then I'll go back to my paper and start talking about that. Um, so it, um, it's not to say that um, colour um, is an objective quality of objects. Colour is something that is organised by the whole context it's in. So I don't know if you've seen this optical illusion before, where if you um, like put your finger in the middle of the screen and separate all like the background out of this, um, the, the two colours of grey are actually the same colour of grey. Um, but um, obviously we see them that the A side is darker. So this is about how um, colour is arranged through a whole kind of field of vision. It's not something specific to an object. It's something that changes. And obviously colour changes with things like nightfall and so on. Um, so let me get back to, um, yeah. So for Merleau-Ponty, colour is not specific to an object. It's not a quality of the object, but something which is arranged through an entire context in the field which is perceived. Um, so colour is not a static quality um, of a singular object. Um, so Merleau-Ponty emphasises the way that we never see singular objects. We always see an entire visual field. We never just see an object in isolation. We never just see a plate. We see a plate on a table next to a fork in a room with coloured walls. Um, so thinking back to Heidegger, how these tools and objects only make sense in relation to each other. Um, Merleau-Ponty says that vision is organised by this whole field and, and to quote, taken as a whole and through a kind of reciprocal action in, it, in which each benefits from the configuration of the rest. So what does this mean for perception? Um, it means that we can't see objects in singularity, but always in relation to an entire, an entire field. Um, so things like colour, depth and lighting are elements of this complex structure. The colours are not fixed, but emerge in the given field. Contextually, um, endowing objects in the world with a, with a local colour that will change according to our movement and position around the object. So if we pick up an apple and we move around it, it'll have different shades of red. Um, so colour is relative to, um, to the interaction between the embodied perceiver, so our painter, and, um, and the context, the, the content of the field which they are perceiving. Um, so Merleau-Ponty admires impressionist paintings, uh, Im impressionists and post-impressionist artists. I don't know why I'm struggling to say that. Post-impressionist artists. Um, so his favourite is Cezanne. Um, one reason in particular is because of the use of colour which evokes this sense of field. Um, so Merleau-Ponty talks about when painters want to depict something striking, um, they do so less by applying a bright colour to that object, but by um, applying colours of, to a kind of distribution of light and shade around the objects surrounding that one. So it's not that um, they create the kind of brightness from the object, but distribute colour around it in the, like the whole field. So it's not that colour is contained within singular objects, but the painter uses colour in a way that utilises the relationship of the objects that surround this particular object, invoking a sense of field. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. And give me one second. Um, oh, let me just figure out what I'm doing. 
so. Okay, so this is a, um, a still life by Cezanne that I wanted to, us to look at. So um, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'll just zoom in a little bit. <laughs> Too much. Um, no, damn it. <laughs> there we go. So um, let's take this watercolor by Cezanne. Um, Cezanne's medium of watercolor here allows him to push the color out and the objects of, um, the object's colours seep out into those around it. So the colours overflow and the merging and bl blurring with those around it. The colour is radiating from within the object rather than being contained to lines. So colour is not a fixed quality. We see the different shades of red and we see the textures and surfaces that change when we move around the, the pomegranates or the watermelon, for example. Um, so Cezanne doesn't reduce objects to concepts with fixed qualities. He, he represents things as they are emerging from a field which we encounter. Miliponti, um, colour, yeah, sorry. Um, so colour doesn't have these fixed contours and claws in it. Um, and for Miliponti, Cezanne makes visible the modulation of colours which stays close to the object's form and to the light it receives and um, sometimes doing away with exact contours in certain cases and um, giving colour priority over the outline. So those are some quotes from his essay, Cezanne's Doubt. So for Merleau-Ponty and maybe for Cezanne, colours are not um, individual pieces of mass with set colours. Get where I'm at. Um, so we can focus on one part of the field in isolation and um, we can focus on one colour, um, on one object, sorry. Oh, I'm just getting lost off. Give me a second. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we can focus on one object in the field in isolation when we take it out of this context. But when we do so for Merleau-Ponty, it loses its thickness in its colour. Um, so Merleau-Ponty saw Cezanne as painting the world as it attacked our senses immediately um, in relation to an entire field. Um, you can isolate the objects, but this is after the immediacy of how they appeared in relation to each other first. Um, it is when they are in this field that there is a total logic of the picture, where there's a coherence of the colours and the spatial forms composed um, on the on the basis of the interrelationship between these things um, the it's the referentiality that contributes to this total logic of a field um, Miliponti says there's a kind of deeper meaning in the organization in the field that goes beyond colors it's also about the geometrical forms and all the sense data and significance of objects which go into form a system our perception is entirely animated by a logic that which assigns each object its determinate feature in virtue of those of those of the rest. So I'm going to talk about the phenomenological significance of painting for a little bit now. Um, so before I expand on this a little bit, um, I should briefly just go back and expand on the phenomenological method, um, which starts out with Husserl's transcendental reduction. So this is the moment of bracketing, where we bracket off, um, we, we pause or suspend the usual way of engaging with the world so that we're able to focus attention on the structures of experience itself. So usually we focused our interest in objects, events and circumstances in the world. But in bracketing, we set this aside. We focus on the features of experience as we experience them attempting to describe the phenomena at how it, as it comes to us. And this amounts to a reorientation from the ordinary perspective to the phenomenological one. Um, so I wanna argue that painting is somewhat like this, uh, somewhat like a phenomenological practice. When in the act of painting, um, a change, there the needs to be a change in perception, which is akin to Husserl's reduction. We have to bracket out the ordinary way we perceive the world in order to access what exactly makes the experience. He goes as far to say that Cezanne um, 
pays the same kind of attention and wonder to the world as um, phenomenology. That's what Merleau-Ponty says about Cezanne. Um, he loves Cezanne. Um, the painter perceives in a way fundamentally different to everyday experience, which is the way of seeing the world as meaning. In order to see the features of, um, and this is in order to see the features of existence that make an object possible. So painters suspend the coordinates of the world that they usually know so that they can see the invisible structures um, of experience, these invisible structures that are fundamental to all experience. Um, so I think this is like bracketing, um, and I think um, painting could be considered a phenomenological method or practice in this way. Painting involves a different way of thinking about, thinking of, understanding or knowing the world. Um, and, and I think this because this is the job of phenomenology um, or even maybe philosophy more generally. It's to unveil that which is so essential to our experience. It's about um, unveiling what is so close to us that we always see it but never notice it. Um, the, the features of experience that have this ghost-like invisible presence. So Merleau-Ponty similarly sees painters as revealing the invisible infrastructures. Um, these invisible infrastructures of normal vision through um, their artistic practice. So in doing so, painters return us to a fundamental aspect of the condition of perception. They show us the means by which objects make themselves um, objects before our eyes as part of a relational field. Painting thereby draws attention to the actual manifestation of appearing and offers the gaze traces of vision. Paintings are therefore useful tools to help us, um, to help relearn us what it's like to perceive. They inform us of how we perceive um, and show the way that form phenomena is presented to us. So now I want to think about what happens when we perceive a, a painting, when we perceive a painting. So, um, we're thinking um, about what it's like to look at a painting um, rather than painting itself, rather than being the painter. Um, so we don't just perceive lines and colours on a canvas. We don't just see the arrangement of colour. Um, in, in, you know, nor do we recognise it as the features of visibility. Um, you know, we don't we don't immediately look at a painting and go, wow, that's a manifestation of appearing. Um, and this is because painters perfect the skill of painting the invisible as visible. Um, and due to this, we're able to see so much more than paint on a canvas. Um, so Merleau-Ponty says that it's because we are of the same flesh of the world that we're able to immediately understand the painting. He says, and to quote, um, our gaze knows what such a pipe, patch of light um, I'm going to start that again. Our gaze knows what such patch of light signifies in such context, and it understands the logic, the logic of illumination. It means that we are able to see depth in paintings that we know have no depth. Um, so he talks about how cave paintings are made up of um, a few lines and, and, and only a few lines, but they're still sufficient enough to make us see hunters and animals. Um, so I want to explore why this is or why to court we go straight to the thing. So in the phenomenology of perception, Merleau-Ponty talks about the um, existential unity of a thing. Um, so this is a certain kind of essence that results in a collection of associations that get bound up with a thing. So Merleau-Ponty gives us the example of someone hallucinating the devil. Um, so he talks about, um, you know, he says that much more than the visual is seen. Um, you know, when, when someone's hallucinating the devil, they see the devil's odour, they feel the heat from his flames, the taste and the smell of this, his smoke. There's a full perceptual experience. And this is because the meaningful devil of unity is just this burning um, essence. These associations and perceptual expectations are stored in our memory which then en en envelops our experience. Um, so this memory isn't cognitive for Merleau-Ponty, it's something bodily again. 
And this is because of the unified body um, that memory is able to assimilate sensory experiences in such way. So the body is a complex system where each part interacts and envelopes one another. Um, different sensory expectations are grounded in the one body and experienced simultaneously. So they are never really distinct. Um, if I see something, there's a possibility of movement towards it. Um, the, you know, as we've spoke about this intertwining of vision and movement, which is why we see a chair as something to sit on. We see it as the possibility of sitting down. Um, so there is a synthesis of the senses for Merleau-Ponty. Merleau-Ponty discusses um, the neuro neurological condition, which I don't think I can pronounce very right. Synthanasia? Synthanasia? Something like that. It's synesthesia. That's the one. Thank you. <laughs> um, so he talks about this condition, condition where perceptual information that is um, usually exclusive to one sensory capacity and um, stimulates several others. Um, so it's the condition that enables people to hear colours and see sounds. Um, as all senses are experienced in one body at once, there's an element of this condition common to us all. Um, so Merleau-Ponty states that if we try to imagine the sensation of red, we'll um, actually see a manifestation of red with a surface that has a texture and a form. Um, so he says it might be a red flag, a red dress or a red rooftop. Um, when I try and do this, I see a little tiny like a little Microsoft Paint red colour block. I don't know why that's what I, comes in my brain when I try to imagine colours in isolation. Um, but anyway, it's the idea that one sense always evokes another to the extent that you can't just have pure sensations in isolated form. Uh, the visual always has a texture. Um, this for Merleau-Ponty is because we experience as one soul body before one soul world, um, which is to quote him from the visible and the invisible again. Um, so this means when we look at paintings, one sense calls forth all the corresponding um, all the corresponding operation of all the others to supplement the visual that's given. So when we look at a, when we look at a painting, we attach textures and smells and associations. It means that we can see textures like softness and coarseness, and as Suzanne said, we even see the order of the landscape. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen again. Give me a little second. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is a painting by Monet um, that I want us to think about in relation to this concept of synthesis. Okay, so it's the idea that um, when we look at a painting, we get so much more than the visual. We get um, a sense of this. Um, the, we get a sense of the smell of the freshly cut grass, the movement in the wind and the leaves, the array of textures from the flowers and the bushes to the flat, the flat stone um, of the building in the background. The arrangement of vivid colours and the careful layering of paint works to signify all the responses that it would give to the interrogation of my other senses. When we see flowers, we go straight to the thing, to um, its essence, and layer these perceptual expectations onto the image. These associations are stored in our bodily memory, developed through our experience, and um, therefore for Merleau-Ponty, memory plays an active role in enveloping our perceptions and creating this horizon of possible meanings. So the unified body with the, in the synthesis of the senses, um, is, is essentially why we're able to associate smells and textures in paintings. It's why we can see movement or associate certain emotional experiences with them. So let me... Um, so I want to focus on this um, emotional dimension of perception. So... Um, I'm going to return to what it's like to live in the world again, to see the world as meaning. So when we see our friends' faces, we rarely conceptualise the arrangement of the features of their face. Um, you know, we, 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 rarely, like, we, we are rarely looking at like the position of their cheekbones and um, analysing the face and, and seeing what, what the face looks like. 
Um, we might do this prior to becoming familiarised with the face in the same way that tools are foreign to us until they become habitual. Um, but after this fact, um, when we look at faces, we actually look for emotion. Um, you could say that we see expression rather than faces in a theoretical sense. Um, to think we only see the physical elements um, of physical properties misses aspects of experience. It doesn't necessarily reduce the experience, but it misses the fact that we see happiness and we see frustration and we see embarrassment. Um, and this is why I think we can be particularly impressed by paintings that can capture emotion or character um, because it's closer to the way that we actually perceive in the world. Um, so again, I'm going to um, share my screen and um, think about Suzanne again. Okay, so the final image that I wanted us to look at today is this um, painting by Suzanne titled Madame Suzanne in Blue. So this is a painting of Suzanne's mistress, uh, then wife and then ex-wife Hortons. Um, so I picked this painting because of the vivid display of emotion here. Um, there is a clear theme of melancholy in the painting, which is relevant to the struggles they were having at the time um, in their relationship. Um, so Suzanne often painted um, Hortons. Um, and her facial attributes can actually be somewhat unrecognisable across these portraits. And I think there's too many portraits of her. She must have been sick of um, sitting down and getting painted all the time. Um, Suzanne didn't get any commissions. So when he wanted to paint, um, he was painting portraits of her. Um, but anyway, getting back to the point, um, her facial attributes are kind of unrecognisable across these portraits. And this is because of rather than focusing on the accuracy of her attributes, Suzanne focused on expressing the emotion. Um, and I think what is particularly interesting here is that there's a certain dialogue that's formed between Hortons and a background, which I think we can um, understand through Merleau-Ponty's conception of field. So the sadness is reflected in the tear shaped, um, the tear shapes on the wall behind her. The furniture is protrude, protruding into her territory. And um, I think the seams on her clothes um, echo the kind of tonal split in the wall behind her. So she becomes kind of lost. Um, she comes kind of lost in relationship um, to the atmosphere that she's in. I'm going to quickly pause the share screen. Um, Yeah, so I think it's um, through this interplay of um, the the subject in, let me get what I'm saying, sorry. <laughs> so it's through this interplay of subject and its environment that Cezanne um, achieves this sense of compositional harmony or what Merleau-Ponty calls the total logic of a field. So I think Hortons' sadness is manifest not only in her expression, but um, rather in the whole field of perception the use of blue, a colour that's cult culturally associated with sadness and stillness and war, is helps to achieve this pervading sense of melancholy. We get um, a certain sinking feeling with her body almost sliding off the bottom of the canvas. And I think the end result is this kind of striking and um, intimate. Um, yeah, so this kind of striking and intimate um, impression of their relationship and their feelings we get a sense of what Suzanne felt there sat in front of her. We get a sense of the tension. Um, I'll shut, stop, there we go. Um, so we get, an, we get, a, we basically get an impression of the couple's inter, interpersonal relationship goals here. Um, so what I wanna talk about next is how paintings are an invitation to take up a painter's world. So we rejoin the painter's experience here. Um, you know, we get a sense of the tension of Suzanne sat in front of her. And I think this is because Suzanne has kind of successfully condensed his own perceptual experience here and then expressed it, um, expressed what is seen through himself permanently through art. So um, to quote Merleau-Ponty from his book Signs, um, 
a painter invites viewers to take up the gesture that created it. Um, this means that when we view a painting, um, we get to see the world the painter inhabited and we get a chance to take that up. So when we see um, paintings even centuries later, we can rejoin the history of this world that the painter envisioned. Um, so when we see um, images of warriors on Greek, on Greek pots, on like a Greek pottery, um, we see the movement of the fight and we might we can we can dwell in it and we see the sand the st uh, the sand that they stand on and we might get a sense of their kind of brass brass armor shine um so when we see a painting we're invited to breathe this world again a painter does not only give invisible qualities a physical existence but also makes their own embodied encounter of physical reality in the world that we're invited to take up the, the warriors we see are not there in the same way as the kind of vase or the pot. Um, but nevertheless, the painting on it causes us to see much beyond this. Um, Merleau-Ponty says that when we look at our painting, it's, our gaze wanders within it. Um, and this is why this happens. So there is much more play, much more at play here when we look at a painting. He says the eyes are much more than simple receptors for light rays, colours and lines. Um, and this is why paintings are much more than representations. Uh, a painter does not only paint what is visible, but the intertwining of the visible and the seeing. Painting is not a simple representation of the world. Um, it's not a fictional copy of the real. It is not only the manifestation of appearing that's presented, but specifically the manifestation of appearing to an embodied consciousness. So Merleau-Ponty quotes Max Ernst, Ernst in um, Eye and Mind. The role of the painter is to project what is visible and seen within himself. Um, so he says the painter does not just paint a simple representation of the world, but their experience in the world with their emotions and smells and even the mental images. So, um, Painting is essentially um, some kind of replication of the intersection of the lived body and the perceived landscape. The a perception that is previously isolated in one's private perception becomes a constitute of the common world, with the painter's world offered and accessible for viewers to take up. Um, however, it is necessary for viewers to take up this world, for painting to gain life and interaction between um, the, the painting and another perceiver is necessary. So we need that perceiving subject. And I think this brings us back to this concept of flesh, that meaning is always found through a reciprocal relation. The artwork is a meaningful place that needs a subject to take up this world. It's this, it's this paradoxical idea again, that uh, this reversible nature of flesh, that um, a, you know, a world or uh, an artwork is already meaningful, but it needs that subject to elicit that meaning. So it's gained in relation. Um, so the fact that we add more to paintings echoes the, the very idea that we're wrapped up in a world of signification. So when we view a painting, we, we project a whole body of thought and meaning onto it, just as we do with objects in the world. This means that when we are painting, when paintings are viewed, each of us will view them slightly differently. And this is because we connect our own memories, our own associations, experiences, traumas, fantasies and desires onto that image. Um, so our embodied experience affects how we engage with works of art, how we give them particular meanings and values. And for this reason, painting can help inform us of who we are. So um, I'm going to conclude my account of Merle Capote on painting now and just give a kind of brief summary of what I've already said. Um, so I wanted to explain how painting has a phenomenological significance for Merleau-Ponty. Um, in the act of painting, the painter's ordinary perception is paused, which I think is like the phenomenological reduction. Um, in this, painters are able to see and then reveal the hidden parts of everyday experience, the invisible infrastructures that we are not usually aware of. Painters, painters here perform a similar role to the phenomenologist in unveiling um, the hidden structures of perceptual experience. So painters work to reveal not only the manifestation of appearing, but how phenomena appears to a conscious subject. 
full of meaning and emotion and textures. Um, so this led us to define paintings as an invitation to breathe a painter's world again, which we join and overlap with our own bodily projections. Um, this ultimately reveals how the meaning of art is always caught up in relation between the viewer and the painting. It's the idea that meaning is caught up with the physical relations between self and world, which is the very basis of Merleau-Ponty's notion of flesh. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. That was fantastic. So if you're OK to take some questions for the remaining time. Yep, sure. That would be great. So people are engaging. Uh, our first couple of questions are specifically regarding phenomenology. Uh, Jack asks, uh, <laughs> what is the ontological status of phenomenology contra the objective reality of classical philosophy? Well, um, in terms of on ontology, um, the idea of flesh is um, Merleau-Ponty's ontological, it's the phenomenological, okay, let me start that again. Heidegger's being in the world is essentially um, what Merleau-Ponty takes as the basis of his ontology. His onto ontological argument is of flesh. Um, flesh is the, um, he calls it the elemental flesh of the world. He calls it um, the element of being. So in terms of Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology, there is this huge ontological basis. Uh, I just didn't want to get into it too much today with time issues. Um, but I, ho I hope that helps answer the question at least. I'm not sure. Thank you. If, if, uh, if Jack has further nuances that he wants to bring in, please continue to ask a further question in chat. Uh, George similarly um, focuses on phenomenology. He, he asks, how does phenomenology relate to ideas of unconscious perception or thought? Yeah, um, I think this is a really interesting question. And I think Merleau-Ponty does deal with the kind of un unconscious moments of thought as well. He's very much into the, the things we just do rather than the um, thought out and um, deliberate actions. So I think phenomenology does def definitely deal with the unconscious parts of existence. And um, I think they are aware of this um, Um, sorry, I just got lost off on my, <laughs> my train of thought. Um, so I think they're aware of this. Um, they talk about how this horizon of possibilities, um, only some of which we're, we're conscious of. So there's always this element of knowing that there's an unconscious level there. They say there's a horizon of possible actions, some of the actions that we're, we're, we're conscious of. So um, I think there's definitely an understanding of the um, unconscious here, especially when we start talking about... Um, the ways we kind of deal with the body so yeah okay so uh, is that katie kate i'll just wear my glasses i think it's katie so katie is taking this uh, george's uh, question further um uh, sorry, it's Kelly. Kelly. Kelly is taking this question further uh, by George. She says, how does phenomenology, especially the view of everything as bodily, situate internal conscious thought that one does in the absence of other people or outside, outside stimulus? It's almost like the case where you were talking about our relation, the relation with others. What if those relations, those, those other things are not there? Um, I'd say that that isn't, um, they wouldn't say that's ever a possibility here. Um, we are all, we are beings in the world. We are always in relation to the world, even if that just means we are sat in a room and thinking by ourselves. Um, you know, this, it's not the idea that we have a brain with a consciousness in that just thinks just in the brain. Um, so it's not like we can just have these isolated thoughts or these abstract thoughts that are not related to um, our worldliness whatsoever. Um, so I think that it's not like phenomenologists disregard the idea that we can literally just think and that we can just, but we're always thinking about something. This is the whole idea of attention, intentionality that we get out of the cell um, that I didn't really mention too much. Um, but it's this idea that um, even if we're just thinking, you're thinking of something, you're thinking about something, you're directed to the world. So even when you're sat in isolation, you're still related to it. There's still this direct and directedness, directedness towards a thing, which is what intentionality is, which is the basis of 
what consciousness is like for phenomenologists. With Merleau-Ponty, he takes this idea of intentionality and calls it sensory motor intentionality, which just brings it back to this kind of bodily aspect. Great, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, so from Jacob, firstly, he uh, really appreciated your paper. He says, banger paper, Zoe. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> His question is uh, with regards to genres and painting. If the painting is dependent on certain bodily modes of perception, would you say this explains the distinction of painterly styles? Movements like art, uh, art, uh, sorry, art brut, and the work of female disab disabled painters like Frida. Kalo seem to speak of bodily experiences radically different from the so-called normative body. Hmm, I don't know how I'd reply to that question. Can I can I get the question again? I think it's interesting though. <laughs> Zoe, shall I forward the question? Please? Yes, please. Okay, I'll just thank you. It. Just so I can have a read of it. Certainly, certainly. I'll just send it to you right now. Privately. Um, I had I had some notes um in relation to just um just, different kind of art styles and how this fits in um in any way um, so there we go i'll just get this question up okay yeah um so i think this is an interesting question because i think it's what it's asking about is if i'm if i'm if i'm reading it correctly jacob and if i'm not we can chat about it afterwards um but um it seems to be asking about what movements are like once the cons once art starts involving kind of embodiment. I think this idea of like disabled or female painters using embodiment in their art, um, which is quite interesting, which I haven't really thought about um, much. But I know that there are a lot of kind of critiques coming from Miller, coming out of Miller Ponty's phenomenology that this um, unified body is a kind of ideal postulate. Um, that doesn't consider kind of, um, you know, disabled experiences as, as prominently. Um, there's obviously the kind of ocular, ocular centric um, issue here where he focuses mainly just on the visual, even though he says that all the, all, all the senses are kind of integrated. Um, but I wouldn't say, um, I, wouldn't, I don't think I know a, um, a direct answer to this question, but I might just comment on kind of different art styles and why Merleau-Ponty saw this as some, um, why Merleau-Ponty saw the phenomenological significance in various different art styles. So um, um, this is going back to this idea of ontology, which has been mentioned in the question and answer. Um, so even though I've mainly spoke about paintings in this kind of traditional kind of representational or still life sense, um, Merleau-Ponty actually thinks that painting reveals um, a deeper part of existence itself because these things like depth, colour and movement are all branches of this elemental flesh of the world, this ontology. So um, painting, all paintings, no matter what style, work with these features. So they all deal with kind of colour and movement and line and whatnot. So therefore they're all dealing with um, a fundamental experience and um, a fundamental structure of experience no matter how abstract they are or what art style they're in. Um, so um, he sees in art, in all styles of art, that um, pres there's a pres presentation of kind of visual states of affairs. Um, and, he, and he basically sees this as the um, ontological significance of painting. I think there's a quote somewhere where he, he says this is the kind of ontological basis of painting. What is revealed is these literal he calls movement and depth and colour branches of being. They are branches of the elemental flesh of the world. Um, so this is why he thinks his argument on painting and embodiment explores all kinds of artworks, no matter how abstract or how different. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, Jacob, but if not, we can just chat about it later. <laughs> We can get back into the Q&A if you like, Jacob. But actually, if I could take that uh, further, Zoe, as you were talking, I was thinking this through. And I don't know if there's, I'm just trying to relate this to your earlier talk. Um, if a painter has a certain um, embodied bodily experience uh, that is different, that the painter is obviously conveying, but 
uh, let's say I haven't had that experience myself. Uh, I nevertheless simply experience it through the painting because I have not had that bodily experience. I am relating that paintings to my own memory. And if my memory doesn't have it, then what happens? Would there be empathy? Would I be linking that with my own memories? What happens? Yeah, I think that he would say um, it's it's definitely the peculiar thing that um, Merleau-Ponty is quite interested in. He talks about us as um, dwelling in the in the being in the image. Um, but I think um, so. He understands that all paintings are attached to a school or um, a history, um, and you know he talks about how we can know absolutely nothing about that history, but we still get a sense of it somehow. Um, so I think he sees the painter is able to express something to some extent, but it's always on the basis of us taking that up. So I think um, even if you haven't had that experience, you'll something will be expressed to you, but it'll be dependent on your embodied, embodied experience of what kind of associations you'll attach to that. Um, does that make sense? It does. Could could it rather than could that painting itself then form part of my bodily experience because I actually experienced it through the painting? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, great. Yeah, since okay. um, paint is a paint arts are equally kind of objects in the world that we um, yeah. <laughs> Lovely, thanks. Okay, uh, from Humphrey. Again, Humphrey's um, uh, very appreciative of your talk, says it's a great, it was a great talk, Zoe. Uh, okay, the question is Merleau-Ponty's account seems to revolve around the notion of a unified body. Does he pay any mind to the intermissions or gaps in our bodily experience? Um, this is an interesting question. Um, I can't, I, think, I can't think of any quotes off the top of my head, but I think he definitely um, doesn't overestimate the extent of the body. So he's quite interested in the kind of ambiguities that we have as, as a unified body. Um, so he definitely appreciates that um, we, our bodies have limits. Um, so when he's talking about this in relation to um, perception and, and the visual, um, he talks about, you know, we have this field of experience, um, but we can actually see more than we can represent to ourselves. So um, we have a certain kind of ambiguity in our vision all the time. You know, if I'm looking at a painting or if I'm looking at the screen in front of me, um, I, I see a bunch of stuff around the side um, in, my, in my peripheral vision. Um, but this is all kind of it, it's in it, there's an ambiguity there because there is this limit of the body and um, so there are these kind of gaps in ambiguities that Merleau-Ponty really wants to look at and um, so he says we have kind of optimal perceptual grips on the things and that's because we are a body and we have a position and there's a best position to be in to see the certain painting right or to see the kind of different angles of the mug that we want to um, and it's because of our embodiment that we are literally physically in a place in position near near something um, and that means that there's a certain optimal grip that we can have on the thing. Um, but there's also a bunch of ambiguities that are part of our experience as an embodied consciousness. There's always the kind of blurred peripheral vision parts. There's when we look out at a mountain and we can't, we can't really see the shape of the top of the mountain, right? Um, and this is another reason why Merleau-Ponty is quite interested in Cezanne because he thinks that the kind of ambiguities in Cezanne's paintings where you can't really see if the if the tiles are square shaped or rectangle or something. Um, and, he, and he thinks this is interesting when we start thinking about the kind of gaps and ambiguities that are part of our perception that we forget about because we overestimate this, the body that we have is that having this kind of strict mathematical and rigid understanding of the world that largely comes after this these moments of ambiguities and gaps fantastic thank you <laughs> um, okay we have a question from mike uh, regarding paints paintings versus other cultural communication forms so mike asks does muller ponty give paintings a special or at least a leading status as opposed to other cultural uh, communication forms such as opera, oral storytelling, or indeed writings as ways of stimulating the reader, viewer, listener's imagination. And it strikes Mike that uh, they 
are more removed from the bodily experience and rely more on the imagination or conceptual input. Would you agree? Okay, yeah, um, that's really interesting. Um, I'll go back to the bit about other branches of um, art, but um, oh, what was I going to say? I've just forgot my line of thought immediately. Okay. Oh, I was going to say the idea of um, imagination is something that is quite in interesting when we think about art, because um, he talks about how when we project our own things, it's an overlapping of the imaginary and the real. So we have the artwork and when we um, see meaning in it, we're essentially overlapping our own imaginary with something that is real and concrete and physical in front of us. So Merleau-Ponty is really interested in the whole cognitive side of experiences as well. It's just that he sees um, cognition as something that is embodied. So it's not like he disregards the, um, the kind of use or importantness of, um, of imagination. But that being said, um, he definitely does talk about painting the most. Um, he talks about um, he talks about sculptures quite a bit. Um, um, I think he likes Rodin quite a lot. Um, but um, from my knowledge, he doesn't really speak about kind of plays or, or writings much. Um, but again, this is from my knowledge. I'm not like a, a mega scholar or anything. Um, but he does seem to give paintings a kind of privileged position or at least analyzes the most. Muller died young, so maybe he would have went on to talk about um, other stuff afterwards. Um, so it's maybe we can't say he gives Peyton's just a kind of privileged position end of, but there is a kind of, he is charged with this kind of ocular centric vision, the ocular centric basis. Um, he focuses on sight and perceiving kind of visual art more than things like music um, or TV or anything like that. Um, so to answer, I think he does focus on paintings more so, but I don't think he explicitly says that they are more significant than other types of art. So the second part of this was that it strikes Mike um, that those other forms of uh, cultural um, experiences, they, have, they are more removed from bodily experience and rely more on the imagination conceptual input. Yeah, well, I think I think that um, I think Meloponti would wouldn't disagree with that. You know, I don't think um, although although there is this massive emphasis on the body, I don't think it's a um, it involves the removal of um, the importance of kind of things that we think of or um, imagine. Um, so there is a huge element of this when we think about um, kind of painting and. What might be interesting is in thinking about what Merleau-Ponty talks about with kind of abstract painting here, because that's all about um, um, a, an embodied person's visual, like imagination being presenting on paper here um, or on a canvas or something. So he does see that. I've lost my train of thought again. <laughs> um, so I just don't think that he disregards the kind of um, what we might conceive of as kind of usual mind activity of imagination um, that seems more removed from the body. He just sees this activity as happening in a body, if that makes sense. Sure. I would, I would say the second part of the question comes straight back to phenomenology because with phenomenology, it's all a bodily experience, um, including the imagination. Yeah. It happens in the yeah. imagination. Okay. So, um, Jacob says, thanks for the answer. It was very helpful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Now, Alexander, so long as I have, okay, Alexander is the next questioner. Uh, again, says, very interesting. Thank you. How do you see Bacon or Lucian Freud in the discussion of the phenomenology and body? Um, well, I really like these painters, but um, I don't really know how um, it fits into, um, I, like Merle Ponty doesn't talk about them much, so I wouldn't be able to give any kind of comment of what he says about that. But I think um, they're definitely really interesting um, artists that probably could be, we could say a lot about them in terms of phenomenology, but I don't think I'm in a position um, to comment on that today. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, actually, if, so long as I haven't, I don't think I've missed anything that comes to, that brings us to the end of our questions. And I was just wondering, we've got another one minute before we wrap up and we've, we've made up for the lost time. Thank you so much, Zoe, for being such a sport and, and to the rest of our attendees. Um, any, any final concluding remarks, Zoe? 
from you? Um, no, just thanks for watching everyone. I really appreciated everyone who's came to see me and everyone else who's here for the day. <laughs> that was great. We really